Hi, I'm Pastor Bill Vigio, me to the Word Ministries. Today I want to continue my theme just like I'm continuing in this shirt. I've got such a passion to get this message out there and break it down for you, rightly divide this subject that I'm not taking my shirt. So you should be very, or taking my shirt off, so you should be very grateful that you're not in this room here right now. Now, leaving off from where I, I left off, it was not God trying to humble Paul or keep him humble by giving him some kind of disability, some thorn in his flesh to humble him, keep him down. That was not God's intention. The scriptures very clearly, Peter and James, they both said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, Peter said, and he will exalt you in due season. James said he will lift you up. And God trusted Paul so much. He knew the integrity of the Apostle Paul that, and, and how faithful he would be that Paul was not only lifted up with an abundance of revelation, he was lifted up into the third heavens. And, and he saw paradise. He heard words and communication and, and uh, messages from the, from the heavenly host that it was not possible for men down here on earth to be able to articulate. And so Paul was a very humble man, and we see that throughout the record of his life. We see the struggles and the hardships that he went through, but out of them all, the Lord delivered him. And that's what we want to focus on. Not the attacks of the devil. Don't fear the devil. Resist the devil. He's a roaring lion, but let's resist him by submitting ourselves to God and do battle. Now, where did the Apostle Paul get this phrase from? You need to understand that, that the Apostle Paul was a master scholar of the Old Testament. And the people that he was ministering to in his day were mostly Jews that were, well, Jews and Gentiles. But he was reaching out to Jews and he would communicate to them from that Old Testament law. And in Numbers chapter 3, we have the reference there. Where, and there's other references. Joshua refers to it as well. It was an idiom. A metaphor that the Apostle Paul was borrowing, bringing into the New Testament. And so it clearly said this. God had said, when you go into the promised land, you were to drive out the inhabitants of the land. And he said in verse 55, Numbers chapter 33, verse 55, that if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land, remove all their images, all their imaginations, all their teachings, all their philosophies, all their traditions, all their bad ways. Everything that you let, left behind you, not God, but you, leave behind, they would become pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides. Now that's what the, Paul, the Apostle Paul was referring to there. He was saying there were still things in his human nature, his flesh, the things with, without and within, that he was still needing to deal with. And he'd been going to the Lord three times. He said, thrice I went to the Lord and asked him to remove this. And Jesus said, my grace is sufficient. But that's for tomorrow. Right now I want to cover a little bit more detail of Numbers chapter 33. If you'll listen very carefully, this will really help you. In verse 51 it says, when you pass over, talking about when you pass over into Canaan land, or the land of milk and honey, the promised land, then you are to drive out all the inhabitants of the land, all their imaginations, all their evil passions. Now symbolically, to you and I today, our land of promise is Christ in us, the hope of glory, or greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. God wants you to understand when you meet Jesus at Calvary's cross, you are to cross over from an old creature to the new creature. Old things have become new. You become a new creature. At the cross, you are crossing over from that old man into that new man. And it's at that time you now have a responsibility of beginning to deal with those inhabitants that have been in your flesh all your life. Those demons, those devils, those lies, that dark area, those, those excuses, all of that stuff. Everything God wants you to remove so that you can be perfected and be like Jesus Christ, reflect the, the very image. Now, he is in the process of working that with us, but there are some things obviously we have to do. The charge in Numbers chapter 33 was that they do it, you have to do it. So when you pass over into your new promised land, all the promises of God are yea and amen. God doesn't want you to be without anything. He promised you. You've got new, you're under a new covenant with a better covenant with better promises. God wants you to be aware of those promises. He gave you his Holy Spirit so that you would know the deep things of God and that you could know the things that are freely given to you of God. He wants you to know his promises, but he also wants you to know to effectively have those promises. You've got to do something. You've got to drive out those 
lying demons that are in there. You've got to quench all the darts, all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You've got to remove it all so that you believe with a single eye, with a single heart, that you say, this is God's will. He told them in verse 53 to dispose of the inhabitants. That refers to all the evil things that are in your life. And he says, I have given you the land. And the land that they had was the land of milk and honey, but the land that you have are all the promises of God to possess. And then he also went on to say, to those that labor, you will divide the inheritance when you, as you drive them out. You will drive them out. To the more, you will give the more. To the less, you will give the less or the fewer. In other words, he's saying, those that, and this is the way God operates, those that persevere and work hard, I mean, give your whole being to God. You are going to earn a greater reward, a greater inheritance. That's the way God told Israel to, to impart the inheritance. The ones that worked harder in those days to drive out the inhabitants of Canaan, those people were to get the, the, the larger land masses, the quality of land. Those that would work less would get less. That's the way God does us, folks. We are not a, God is not a socialist. He's not a communist. That system does not work. Well, I have to go right now, but I'm going to have another session at least on this one because I believe that there's so many things here that can that really need to be highlighted, pointed out, and driven out of your life so that when you hear Paul's thorn in the flesh, you think of a victory over it, not a battle on its way. God bless.